book of John, chapter number 4 this morning, John chapter number 4. You know, I, when my son was telling me that uh, after the events of last weekend that one pastor said, well, I've got to change my message now, and uh, uh, I've been talking here at Liberty for a while, uh, a, a, something's coming, didn't I? been saying that, and there's more coming. Uh, but you know what? God's people's prepared. You know, Jude said, I wanted to write unto you of the common salvation that we all share, but it was needful for me to write unto you that we should earnestly contend or fight for the faith. Well, we've been talking about that for some time, but this morning I want to talk to you about the common salvation that we share, amen? So in John chapter 4, we'll be there in just a moment, there's a cemetery in Rochester, New York that has a, a most unusual gravestone uh, there's no name on it, there's no uh, date of birth, there's no date of death. The stone is unembellished with uh, uh, artist work or anything like that. There's no epitaph or no eulogy. It only reads one word on the tombstone. Forgiven. Forgiven. You know, I, I'm glad this morning that we've got some good news. Every one of us can be forgiven by God from our sins, amen? Amen. Sins, past, present, and future. God's forgiveness is extended to you. It can be experienced by you if you will only embrace it. Amen? So with that in mind, I want you to read our text with me this morning. And I hope you have your Bibles with you. It's so good to hold God's Word in our hands and to look and to see what I'm saying. I want you to check me out. Make sure what I'm telling you is the truth. Amen? Because uh, we worship in spirit and truth. And so with your Bibles, in Romans 4, verse 7 says this, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Someone wrote the song, You ask me why I'm happy? Well, I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers, they ask me where they are. I say, my sins are gone. Where are they? They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, as far removed from darkness from the dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's good enough for me, praise God. My sins are gone. Well, this last week I told you I'm going to be a bachelor all week. I had three crazy dogs that are used to staying up till 3 in the morning with gamers in my house when I go to bed between 8 and 9 every night because I, I got to work for a living, right? And so uh, I wanted to kill the dogs. My wife says, you better not. I said, I'm, I'm contemplating it. I'm contemplating it. Can't leave them out back because they whine and scratch and bark and squeal and, oh, my word. Yeah, I had a time with them. One of the things I set myself to do while I was by myself this week is, by nature, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a clean freak. I'm a little OCD, kind of like Miss Sarah over here. You know, we, we see eye to eye on that. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to really get some stuff done this week, and I've had this light fixture. I've been trying to hang for multiple weeks. I've had to rewire it three times because I messed it up. And so I, I started doing some stuff. I started organizing some things. I started getting rid of some things and throwing some trash out. Why? Because I hate clutter. I hate clutter. I absolutely despise it. I want everything to be in its place. And the trash bin, after me doing all of that this week, of course I forgot to push it out on Tuesday, but by Friday it was overflowing. And I didn't like opening the lid because it wasn't smelling so good. It was in desperate need of being taken away. You see from our text this morning that God's trash day was some 2,000 years ago at a place called Calvary, and that was the day that forgiveness of sins took place on an old rugged cross of Calvary. And that's what happens when God takes the trash out. He says, you know what, I'll, your sins, I'm going to take them away if you will come to me in repentance and faith. And can I tell you this morning, some, maybe many, are in desperate need for God to take the trash out if you know what I mean this morning. With that in mind, I, I want you to think with me and notice, first of all, why forgiveness is essential. Why does a person need to be forgiven? Why? 
Well, there's two reasons. First of all, because of the problem of sin within us. Now, if you're in your Bibles, I want you to go back one chapter to Romans chapter 3, and let's look at verse number 10, and we're going to read down for a few verses. And notice what it says. We're talking about the problem of sin within us. And Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. They're in, and here's the real problem. There's no fear of God before their eyes. What we find is sin is an inside job. And so when we think about the problem of sin, we need to understand that sin is, listen, the heart of the problem is, it's a problem of the heart. The Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? Listen, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And the Bible tells us that. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's me, that's you, that's all of us apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 51 and verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me and it tells you that from the very beginning of our lives, we are sinners. And when you may be sitting here this morning and you might be asking, why does God deal so severely with sin? And here it is, because sin is an attack on the holiness of God. It's an attack. The Bible says that sin or iniquity makes us the enemies of God. So we, we dare not stay in our sinful condition. Listen, there's consequences to committing sin. What does the Bible say the consequences of sin is? Death. It's death. And you might be thinking this morning, well, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not really sure that, that I like that. Well, I want you to listen, and you don't have to turn there, but listen to what Ezekiel said in chapter 18 and verse 4. He said this, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It shall die. Romans 6.23, uh, a part of the gospel message and what we call the Romans road, Starts in Romans 3.10, but in 6.23 says the wages or the cost of sin is eternal death. And so the Word of God uses a lot of different words to describe sin. Words like calamity, distress, adversity, grief, affliction, misery, sorrow, trouble, wretchedness. All these different things. And I could go on and on. And there's many words, defilement, you know, wickedness. I mean, all these things. You know, when you think about sin, you know, people today, and even a lot of pastors today, they use a lot of other words to refer to sin, don't they? And in fact, most people and most pastors refuse to call sin, sin. I've heard very famous pastors of megachurches sit and being interviewed by secular uh, a talk show host and different things like that and, and, and trying to be put on the spot about sin. And, and I mean, they, they're running all around it and they refuse to call it what it is. And the Bible says, sin is enmity with God. And so understand this, while most people and, and most pastors refuse to call sin what man calls an accident, God calls an abomination. What, what man calls a defect, God calls depravity. What man calls error, God calls enmity. What man calls a mistake, God calls madness. What man calls a trifle, God calls a tragedy. What man calls weakness, God calls willfulness. Think about all the sciences out there, sociology. They call it a cultural lag or the psychiatry. They call it emotional behavior. Philosophy refers to it as irrational thinking. 
I should say so. Humanists, they classify it as just human weakness. Marxism, they call it a class struggle. And psychology refers to it in terms of, of psychogenes and gastric juices, some really weird stuff. What, what about Freudian? Freudian would call it a slip. Politicians refer to it as perhaps, not very much these days, inappropriate conduct. The criminologist says it's antisocial behavior. Liberal theologians say, you know what, it's a lack of, of social action. But folks, here's what God says it is. God calls sin, sin. Amen? And every person under the sound of my voice right now, every one of us have been diagnosed with the same condition, and that is we are sinful. We are sinners. And you say, well, pastor, I don't know about that. Well, listen to what 1 John says in uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. And here it is. Listen to this. Teens, listen to this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and His word is not in us. So what do we know right there by the Word of God written by John? We're sinners. And if we say that we don't sin, we are liars and we make God out to be a liar because He said we're sinners. You know, the truth of the matter is there are some folks that are down and out, some folks that are up and out, some folks that are out and out, and then some folks that are in and out. But let me tell you folks, in our flesh without God, we're all out. We're all out. And every one of us needs to be forgiven, amen? Understand this morning, there's never been a man, a woman, a boy, a girl that's ever lived that did not need the forgiveness of Almighty God except the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, amen? So why does a person need to be forgiven? Well, the problem of sin within us. But notice the second thing with me this morning. Because of the power of sin over us. You remember what Paul said? He said, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things... I, 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 I shouldn't do. Those are the very things I find myself doing. Anybody ever feel like that? Amen? And maybe it's not so much the, that I'm not doing, that I'm doing a bunch of really bad things, but it might be that I'm not doing the good things. And a lot of people are okay with that. Well, you know what? I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with the girls that do. So I must be a pretty good old person, huh? But there's a whole book of the Bible of things that we ought to do. And we're saved from sin unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, free, we're saved from doing sin to do the Lord's will, amen, and the Lord's word. And so what do we see right here? The power of sin over us. Listen to Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, listen to this, that's the Jewish nation of Israel, the Gentiles, that's all the rest of us, that we are all under sin. And then Romans 3.23 says it, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's the imagery right there? The imagery is of an archer and there's a target out there and we pull back, we draw back, and we release the arrow. The problem is we fall short. It's not that we miss the target. It's not that we get close to the target. We fall short of the target. Because what is the target? Absolute perfection. What is the target? Sinless perfection. Matthew 5, 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's a command, by the way. Well, how's that going to happen? I'm not perfect. Only through the blood of Jesus. And we'll talk about that. So we see the power of sin over us, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. In his book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, C.S. Lewis, he wrote about a boy named uh, Eustace, and he became a dragon, the boy did, and of course it's fantasy. In order for him to become a little boy again, he had to undergo this tremendous change of where, where the, uh, and it was very painful, where the dragon skin had to be peeled and torn from his body so that he could become a little boy again. And after he endured this, this painful transformation, 
Only then could he become a boy who had been a dragon. Lewis concluded this, he said, In much the same way, the sin we take on becomes such a part of us, such a part of us, our daily lives, that it requires this same kind of painful ripping and tearing away from us to truly set us free. Why is it so hard to put certain things down? Why is it so hard to put away certain habits? Why is it so hard to put off certain people that are bad influences in our life? The truth of the matter is, when it comes to sin, we cannot help it. Being a sinner is who we are, and therefore sinning is what we do. Why do people lie? Because they're liars. Why do people steal? Because they're thieves. Why do people covet? Because they're covetous. Why do people fornicate? Because they're fornicators. Why do people drink? It's because they're drunks. Why do people murder? It's because they're murderers. Why do people blaspheme? It's because they're blasphemers. Why do people cuss? It's because they're cussers or cursers. Or what I was trying to find the proper grammar for the plural of cussers, people that cuss. People sin. Why? Because they're sinners. J. Dwight Pentecost, I actually went to a garage sale the other day, and they had, I go there because you can pick up books. I, I picked up 17 really good book, Christian books. One was by Dwight Pentecost. The other was, uh, others, some of them were by Arthur Pink, and, and these are some really good uh, reference materials for Christian study along with the Bible. And J. Dwight Pentecost was a, a great expositor of yesteryear, and I got one of his books, Things to Come. It's an excellent book on the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said this, The doctrine of depravity, that's our sinful condition, had to do not with man's estimation of man, but with God's estimation of man. Now, let me explain what he's saying right there, lest I lose you. He's saying... It doesn't have to do with you comparing yourself with another person. In other words, you looking at somebody and go, well, you know what, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And and I think probably we've all been guilty of that. Uh, You know what, I'm doing pretty good. I I mean, I'm not as good as I'm I'm going to be one day, hopefully, by the Lord's grace, but I'm not as bad as oh so-and-so. And here's what he says. It's not man's estimation of man, but God's estimation of man. So widely accepted is the concept that we have come to feel there is so much in the worst of us, in other words, the criminals, the murderers, the rapists, all those, in the worst of us, that man is not so bad off after all. In other words, when we look at them, we go, you know what, I'm a pretty good old guy, or I'm a pretty good old gal. But here's what he says. But the scripture do not measure man by man. They measure man by God who created man. The creature is measured by the creator and is found wanting, he says right here. Now listen, sin dirties the soul, doesn't it? It dominates the mind. It depresses the heart. It diseases the body. Yes, it does. It defiles the spirit. It destroys your testimony. And it disgraces the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what sin does. I'll tell you what sin does. It turns happiness into heaviness. Amen. You know, uh, Moses said it. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but then comes the payoff. But anyone that says sin is not fun is lying to you. Sin is fun for a while, and then God's judgment comes. Now, for the unsaved, that judgment is is stayed until the great white throne of judgment when they're then bound hand and foot and cast into the lake of fire. But for the Christian, those that have been born again, when we sin, if we don't get it under the blood, that chastening hand of God comes into our life right then. And the scariest place you could possibly be as a person that professes to know the Lord Jesus Christ is to know that you're living in known sin, having not confessed it, and not find the chastening of God in your life. If you're living in sin as a Christian, and everything in your life is just hunky-dory, then friend, you're probably not a Christian, because the Bible says that God loves, chastens every son and daughter, because He loves them. 
just like a good parent does. You know, we don't let our kids run out in the street. Why? We don't want them to get hit by a car. We love them, and we discipline them when they run out there after we told them not to. When they do bad things, we discipline them. Why? We don't want our children to grow up to be criminals. Amen? And I'm not going to get into the modes of, of uh, discipline. I mean, that's between you and the Lord, but the Bible's pretty clear on discipline and what works. I know what worked for me, and I know what worked for my sons. Sin turns happiness into heaviness. It turns satisfaction into sorrow, joy into judgment, blessings into bitterness, and bitterness eats away at your soul. It turns delight into disappointment. There was a, a missionary wife, and I suppose she was like me. She was a little OCD, kind of a clean freak, and they moved into a small hut on the mission field, and they moved in there, and she noticed immediately the floor was terribly dirty. And so once they got settled, she went to work cleaning the floor. Now, my mom was the original clean freak. This lady, I mean, she's with the Lord since 2000. She pulled the refrigerator out once a week, not a month, once a week, and back in behind it. I didn't know there was a, a tray under the refrigerator. She pulled the front of it off. She'd get under there and vacuum that thing out. Vacuum the coils out. I think that old, uh, I think it was a brown or avocado. Remember those color refrigerators? They might be popular again. I don't know, but that's what we had. I think that thing was about 50 years old when the tornado hit and blew it finally away. That was God's grace on that uh, refrigerator. It had been forever because she kept it clean. It worked. This missionary his wife was a clean freak. She realized the floor is very dirty. She got to scrubbing on the floor, and the more she scrubbed, it seemed like the dirtier it got. And she was so frustrated at this until a, a, a lady in the village came to her and she said, Ma'am, you're cleaning the floor. The problem is the floor is a dirt floor. Folks, it doesn't matter how much we try to tidy up our lives. The more we scrub, the more sin we stir up. The problem of sin within us is because of the power of sin over us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that great German preacher, said this, at the moment when lust takes control, when lust takes control, God loses all reality to us. Satan does not fill us with the hatred of God, but with the forgetfulness of God. Hence, lust is conceived and sin is produced. And isn't that so true? You fight it, lust is there, and, and once you're into that object of sin or that lust, it's like God disappears. And it's like the flesh, the world, and the devil is taking precedent. The Bible says, lust when it is conceived bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Listen, the reason why a person who is living in sin feels guilty, why? It's because they are guilty. We're being told that, you know what, we just need to adjust our lives to the guilt. You know, we just need to appropriate that and put it in a compartment and, and not worry about it. Uh, listen, we don't need to adjust our lives to guilt. We need to alleviate ourselves from guilt. Amen? We don't need more information. We don't need reformation, and we don't need rehabilitation. You know what we need? We need a holy transformation that comes through God's salvation. That's what we need. Notice the second thing. Not only do we see why forgiveness is essential, but secondly, notice how forgiveness is experienced. How it's experienced. Think, I think everyone would agree that there's a common denominator that we all share. What is it? We don't intend to, but it's sin. We do bad things. We violate God's word right there, okay? And it doesn't matter what the world calls it, what the world says is this or that. What does God say, amen? We live by the book. We're, we're, we're God's people, a peculiar people called to be holy, amen? And so when we're not that, we live in sin. We can't help it. Why? We're born that way. So what's the solution? We need to be forgiven, amen? And forgiveness is absolutely essential for every single one of us. I don't know about you, but I want to be forgiven. God woke me up this morning early about 3 o'clock, and I'd had a dream about a person that years ago had not been very nice to me. 
And it was interesting because the dream was actually a pretty good dream involving the individual. And I woke up and on my mind was the passage where God says, if you won't forgive them of their trespasses, I won't forgive you of your trespasses. And so I prayed this morning, God, any, anybody and everybody in my life that I've got bitterness against or I've held a grudge against because they did me wrong, I forgive right now before you. And I don't want to ever think about them in that light again, ever. And I don't know why that was on my heart, except the Bible tells us that if you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. Amen? And we need to be forgiven. It's absolutely essential. But understand that we can never be forgiven because of something that we do when it comes to God. Do you understand that? We can only be forgiven because God, God does something for us that we cannot do, and quite frankly, we don't deserve to have done. But God does that for us, amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to shout glory. Hallelujah, amen. I don't know about you, but I can't do it, but that makes me want to jump a few rows of chairs, amen. That God did for me what I could never do for myself and that I don't deserve to have done for me. And folks, that's a good thing. It's called grace and it's called mercy. Not according to works of righteousness, which we have done, Titus says, but according to his mercy, he saved us. I shout glory, hallelujah. So how do we experience forgiveness? Notice, first of all, we experience forgiveness if we have a repentant heart. Repentance, what does that mean? Let me, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate it for you right here, and I won't get off the, the camera, but repentance is I'm living my life this way. I'm walking this way. And in that moment when I'm confronted with my sin, I stop dead in my tracks, and I turn from my sin the world behind me, the cross before me, and I go to God. Amen? That's what it means. Repentance. It's a turning. And it means to turn from sin to God. It, it, and quite frankly, it's a reorientation reorient, of your mind, of your thoughts. Amen? I think we'd all agree. If we're going to live for God, then we've got we to gotta change some things that go on up here. And, and let me just say this. Garbage in, garbage out. We can't feed our heart and mind with all these things in the world that we know we shouldn't be watching, we know we shouldn't be listening to, we know that we should have nothing to do with. We can't let that keep coming in. And even some people that, are, that really need to be a reduction in our life, let me just put it that way, that are bad influence. It doesn't mean we don't love them, doesn't mean we don't pray for them, but if they're going to be in our lives and they're going to continue to influence us to do bad things, say bad things, and be a bad person, they need to go. What do we need to do? Reorientate this old thinker up here. Change our thinking. You know what we need to do? We need to start thinking about sin the way God thinks about sin. Amen? When we can see sin the way God sees sin, it'll change our entire lives. And here's how you can tell whether or not you've, been gen you've genuinely repented of your sins. You want to know how you can tell? You begin to hate what God hates. Amen? You begin to love what God loves. The Bible says that Jesus loved the church and died and gave himself for it. Amen? So if Jesus loved the church, we ought to probably love church. Amen? Alan Redpath, once pastor... Well, you know what, I'm, I'm not even going to share that story this morning. Here it is. Repentance is turning your back completely on the world and its way of living life. You know, the, the mindset of the world out there has a way of living, a way of thinking that we ought not to embrace. Amen? That we ought to reject. That we ought to, listen, we're not to be obtuse. We're not to be mean-spirited. We're not to hate. Uh, on people, we hate sin, amen, but we love, we love people. But we're not, to, we're not to embrace that, we're not to live in that, we're to reject that completely. Listen, repentance is turning your back completely on the world, the flesh and the devil and its ways of living. It simply means that you have to, listen, have no desire to go back to living the way you were living before you were saved. Can you remember that moment when you were saved? I do. I talked about it last Sunday, July 26, 1992. Service started at 6. By 7, we were done. And by 7.05, I was up there waiting. 
from my pastor. I remember. And not everybody remembers the exact day or time. And, and I, honestly, I don't even remember what the message was. But I remember it was like God came in the person of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus and sat down right beside me and put his arm around me and said, I love you, son, and you need to be saved. By the way, there's a vast difference between being sorry for an act and being sorry because you got caught in an act. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, Godly sorrow worketh repentance, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And there's a lot of people that do a lot of really bad crimes, and they go, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, they're not sorry because they did it. They're sorry because they got caught. Listen, but for one to experience forgiveness, not only must there be, what, a repentant heart, are you teens awake this morning? A repentant heart, but a responsive heart. We received the classic Old Testament illustration involving Abraham in Romans chapter 4, our text. Look there in verse number 2. Notice what it says in verse number 2. It says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. But what saith the scripture? I love that part right there. It doesn't matter about what you think. What does God's word say? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The illustration is for our observation, but the application is for our obedience. Amen? And he goes on in verse 4. to Notice this. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, that's talking about working for salvation, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, those that are working to be saved. And understand, a lot of religions are like this. They say, you've got to join a certain church to be saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. And I believe if churches, if they're different, then they're not the same. Amen? And I believe there's churches that are wrong, and there are churches that are right. I believe that. I believe there's preaching that's wrong, and then there's preaching that's right. And if they're preaching that you need to join a certain church to be saved, you need to be baptized to be saved, you need to do good works to be saved, Folks, that's a false gospel. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Amen? For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Amen? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're created in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. The day we got saved, we were created in Christ Jesus. And that day, good works were not for salvation. They were the result of salvation. They were not the root of salvation. They were the fruit of salvation, as we talked about last week. Amen? So we don't work to be saved. And we definitely don't baptize to be saved. And let me just say this, and I'm going to say it, and some people aren't going to like it, but you find a church that says salvation and is believing and being baptized, that is a false salvation. In fact, I believe it's such a false salvation that if you believe, even if you name the name of Jesus, but you also believe that you have to be baptized to be saved, then you've never truly been saved. I believe that. Because what does that do? That, that's dividing Christ's sacrifice. And that's saying, Christ, you weren't good enough. Your blood wasn't good enough. I, got, I had to do something more. Now, the Bible says they that gladly received the word were baptized. Amen? And we find the example of the thief on the cross that was saved. And he simply said this. And the word is the same word that Paul used on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. It's simply this, Lord. Lord means not only Savior, but you're the boss. I'm following you. Whatever you say, that's what I'm doing. 
Just like Paul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? That thief on the cross that said, uh, who Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he said. That's his salvation testimony. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And I've heard theologians go, well, paradise is not heaven, but it's, you know, hey, if Jesus is there, I'd sign me up. Amen? The more a person works to be saved, the more they sin. Now think about this, because that sounds like kind of an oxymoron statement right there. The more a person works to be saved, the more they sin. By trying to work their way to heaven, they're only creating a bigger sin debt, the Bible says. Why? Because works can never merit grace. Because grace is God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. Amen? So in, in working to be saved, you're being a disgrace to God's grace. We see it in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus, he was talking about those that would stand before him at the great white throne of judgment. Now there's two judgments. The Bema Seat judgment is the judgment for believers where they receive their, their crowns and their rewards. With the word Bema, we see it in the Olympics, uh, gold, silver, and bronze, and it's a stepping stone. And rewards, there's no communistic heaven. Rewards will be given according to works for Jesus, amen? And he talks about this. So the Bema Seat judgment's for the Christian, but the great white throne of judgment is for the lost that are on their way to hell, and, they, and they, they're dead in trespasses and sin. Uh, they argue with Jesus at the great white throne of judgment. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about this, and he said they, they, they are talking about all their good works as a reason for them to be admitted into heaven. I'm a good person. I'm a good husband. I'm a good wife. I've done good things. I try really hard. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7. And verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the will of the Father which is in heaven? It's to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God sent to seek and to save that which is lost. And Jesus goes on in verse 22 and he says this, And many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name. That's, that can be the foretelling of the future, or prophesying can be the, the, the Greek word caruso, which is, is to herald forth even the preaching of, of the word of God. They said, this is what we've done. We've prophesied in your name, Jesus. And in your name, Jesus, we've cast out devils. Holy smoke. And in your name, we've done many Hear me, church, wonderful works. Now, the thing that doesn't happen between verse 22 and 23, you don't find the Lord Jesus denying what they're saying. You don't find the Lord Jesus saying, you never prophesied in my name. You don't find him saying, you never cast out devils in my name. You don't find him saying, you're a liar, you never did any good, wonderful things. Here's what he says in verse 23. After they say all of that, he says, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, in all of their doing to get saved, to merit grace, they were just creating more sin that would be held against them. Even to do these good things to be saved becomes sin against God's grace and it's held against them in the judgment. So the more a person works to be saved, the more they're lost. However, listen to this, the less a person works and the more a person believes, there it is, believes, they're responding to God's only requirement for forgiveness is what? To believe. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for what? Righteousness. You know what? I'm not believing in me. <laughs> no way, Rick Ross. I'm like Paul. I have no confidence in my flesh. I mean, we were talking the other day, and it was talking about how somebody, uh, these people that go in and these stores and grab stuff and walk out and, and steal it, and how one of the employees that a particular, my, one of my uh, fellow workers worked at this place, and one of them that stole it punched this guy in the face. And I'm like, ooh, 
I'd get fired. You punch me in the face, there's a, there's a red nuke button that goes nuke, and I just kind of lose control, and I don't know. I mean, I'm an old, broken-down man, but something bad's going to happen for as long as I can do it to that person that punched me in the face. And I, I know we're supposed to turn the other cheek and, you know, be, take that, but I don't know. Y'all pray for me. I need prayers. Listen, responding only to God's requirement of forgiveness, and, and this is it, believing in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary is what's going to save you. It's trusting him and not me. Like Paul, I have no confidence in my flesh. I might do something really bad if somebody punches me in the face. I won't be happy about it afterwards, but in that moment I might do that. I might say something mean or harsh that I don't want to say, but in a moment of weakness or frustration, I can do that. Can I get a witness, amen? I can do that. I don't want to, but I can. And so, understand, understand this. It, 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 it's not these works that we do. It's not our ability to accomplish. Listen, if I could save myself, I could walk into heaven one day and go, hey, everybody, check me out. Look at me. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. But the Bible says there will be no glory in, in heaven except in the Lord Jesus Christ. When John, the beloved, got a, a glimpse of Jesus in the, in the revelation of Christ, when he, when not, when he saw him, this is the one that, that had laid his head on the bosom of Christ when he was alive here on earth before his ascension. He said, when I saw him, I just fell at his feet as dead. He was scary. Because he wasn't a meek, and, meek lamb like he was when he came the first time. He was like a roaring lion. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished brass. And his vesture is dipped in blood. Are you in need of forgiveness today? Are you carrying around an immense load of guilt, shame, maybe condemnation? Here's the question. Do you want to be freely forgiven? Would you like to be fully forgiven? Amen. Do you want to be finally forgiven once and for all? There's these other false religions that, that teach, man, if you don't toe the line, you can lose your salvation. Well, let me be the bearer of bad news. If that's true, which it's not, by the way, but if that's true, Hebrews tells us, you can never be saved again. You know why? Because Jesus would have to go to the cross and die all over again. Romans chapter 4, our text, look at it, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. This is the one that's working for it. But of debt. But to him that worketh not, but simply believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So here's what I say. Stop trying. Start trusting. Amen? If you want to experience forgiveness, and then, then come to God on His terms. And what are His terms? Just agree with what He says and accept what He has done for you. Amen? At Calvary. That's what the, whole, the cross was all about. The innocent dying for the guilty. And the Bible says... Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Respond to God's repentance in repentance and faith, and He will save you. Notice the last thing this morning. Not only do we see why forgiveness is essential and how forgiveness is experienced, but the last thing I want you to see is when forgiveness is embraced. What happens? At that very moment, listen, when forgiveness is embraced, what God has done for you is embraced. At that very moment, a transaction takes place in heaven. What happens is, and, and understand this, at that very moment, God literally takes the trash out. Hallelujah. My sister came by to bring me some food and water and stuff like that. And she's so sweet, and we talked for a while. And on the way out, because I still had these puncture wounds in my knee and not supposed to do anything except ice. She goes, uh, all right, well, I'm going to leave. Is there anything you need me to do? I said, yeah, can you push that trash can to the, drive, to the uh, street out there for me? <laughs> I said, it stinks really bad. And she opened it up, and I could, oh, my word. 
And she drug it out there, and I sure appreciate her doing that for me. You know what? The minute you embrace Christ in repentance and faith, he takes the trash out. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. So that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen. So at that moment, what happens? Your guilt is exchanged for God's grace. Your filth for God's forgiveness. Your rags for God's righteousness. Notice a couple of things here. You notice what you receive. First of all, a holiness that cannot be mistaken. Look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man whom, listen to to this, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. You're declared righteous without works. So in verse 5 we see the word justifieth. In verse 5 and 6 you see the word righteousness. What happens when a person comes clean before God? He walks away cleansed by God. Amen? I don't know about you, but this has got me excited. Amen? The word justify is the word pardon. And here's what it means. The moment you're saved, you don't owe the devil a nickel. Done. Paid in full. Amen? And it's just as if you had never sinned in the eyes of God. Amen? The word righteousness, what does that speak of? That speaks of a change of position. You were a lost sinner on your way to hell. Now you're a saved sinner on your way to heaven. Yeah, we still have this sin problem. Why? Because our soul is chained to a a sinful body. And Paul's words about his frustration of not doing the things he should and doing the things he shouldn't is an example of that. Saved on the road to Damascus, but still frustrated by sin. Listen, this is amazing what God does right here. He no longer sees your sin. He only sees the blood of his precious son. Amen. William Copper was a man that suffered from great bouts of depression and tried taking his life actually three times. And he was so depressed and so frustrating, he said, frustrated, he said, you know what? I can't even succeed at killing myself. One day he was walking down the, the street in Chicago, I believe it was, and he was walking by a mission, and he could hear the singing and the shouting and the preaching. And he stopped and stayed outside, and he listened for a while. It was then that he heard a man get up and tell about how God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3.16. And that night, William Copper gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And think about it like this. Years later, this man that wanted to bleed to death because of depression wrote this. There is a fountain filled with blood. You know it now? Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Amen? So we see a a holiness that cannot be mistaken, but a happiness that cannot be matched. Notice verse 7. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Notice that. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That word blessed right there, it's used 50 times in the New Testament. In the Greek, here's what it literally means. When it's used as an adjective, it means, Oh, how happy. Oh, how happy I am. And what it means is, when a person embraces God's forgiveness, it can really literally read just like this. Oh, how happy I am that my iniquities are forgiven and my sins are covered. Oh, how happy I am because the Lord does not impute sin to me. Amen? What is it that creates such happiness in a a heart of a person that's forgiven? I'll tell you what, number one, Jesus covers those sins up. In verse 7 it says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That word covered means concealed. Listen, God takes the most shameful part of our life, and I'm so thankful. You know, I remember a preacher preaching one time that we're going to get to heaven, and uh, 
we're going to be there as Christians and God's going to show our entire life, all the bad things we did on the screen. And I'm like, man, I don't want that. That's not happening, by the way. You know why? They're covered. They're covered, amen? When they're under the blood of Jesus, God the Father sees them no more. Why? He sees the blood of Jesus. When Satan comes and accuses the brethren, the, the brethren you, that's you, that's me. And by the way, he doesn't have to lie. He, can, he don't have to make stuff up. He can come before God and say, you know what, Rick, let me tell you what he did, and he's telling the truth. But Jesus stands up and goes, Father, it's under the blood. It's covered. But not only does he cover it, he cancels it. Amen? Romans 4, 8 says, Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Uh, Cullen would get this because he's an accountant or he has those degrees. This is an accounting term right here. You know what this means? When an accountant is keeping track of transactions, in this case, sin, it means that he's keeping a ledger of every sin that you've ever done. I don't know about you, I don't want that. Somebody said, yeah, when me and my wife get in, a, get in a fight, she gets historical. He says, no, don't you mean she gets hysterical? He says, no, she gets historical. She brings up everything I've ever done wrong. I'm glad God doesn't get historical. Amen. It means to take inventory. And it means to, to, to bring up all these things. But when a person comes to God in repentance and faith and confesses their sin, asking for God's forgiveness, what does God do? He blots out the account. And, and I'll just tell you this, he doesn't just erase lines on the ledger, he closes the account. <laughs> Amen? It's a lost item never to be recovered again. Notice lastly, he carries them away. Verse 7, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. The Greek word there is amphimi. What it means is to send forth or to send away. When our sin is forgiven, God immediately sends it away. Listen to what Micah 7.19 says. Micah 7.19, the last, the last book that says, talks about this. Listen, he will turn again and he will have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities, subdue them, and will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Amen? The psalmist had a lot to say about this. He had some pretty big mess ups in his life, didn't he? And in Psalm 103, verse 12, he says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath God removed our transgressions from us. Do you understand that you can't measure from east to west? The shortest distance between two points, we learned in ge geometry. I hated that class in high school. But the shortest distance is between point A and point B. But with east and west, there is no point A and point B. Understand, there's no place where east ends and west begins. East is always in front of us, isn't it? If we head east, it's always in front of us. If I travel from California to New York, what, what, what is it? It, it, it? East is still in front of me. If I travel from New York to England, east is still in front of me. If I travel from uh, England to Europe, east is still in front of me. If I travel from Europe to Japan, east is still in front of me. If I travel from Japan back to California, east is still in front of me. Why? The distance cannot be determined. Why? Because it's infinite. The world's largest oceans are the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic, and the Indian. Listen to this. And I love useless trivia like this. My wife will tell you my brain's full of it. But the deepest part of the Indian Ocean is the Java Trench. It's 4.8 miles deep, okay? 4.8 miles deep. The deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean is the Puerto Rico Trench. It's 5.3 miles deep. And the deepest spot in the Pacific Ocean is the Mariana Trench, and it's 6.8 miles deep. That's the ocean. I can't imagine what's down there. How would you like to be up there and not knowing what's seven miles below you? What's cool is the Bible says, and God says, I'm going to cast your sins as far as east is from the west in the depths of the sea. And you know what I believe? God's not saying here, you know what? I'm going to cast your sins exactly seven miles down. What I believe God is saying is, I'm going to put them so far away that they can never be found. They can never be remembered. Amen? 
Charles, Charles Spurgeon responded to this text and he said this, If sin be removed so far, then we may be sure that the scent, the trace, the very moment, moment of it must be entirely gone. If this be the distance of its removal, there's no shade of fear of it ever being brought back again. Even Satan himself could not achieve such a task. So now we see why the word used here is, oh, how happy. I'm so happy that nobody can find those sins. Amen? Nobody. It's because God has taken that sin, He's covered it, He's canceled it, and He's carried them away. Amen? That's when God takes the trash out, right? That stinky defilement, He takes it away. He disposes of it in the sea of His own forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. Folks, understand something right here. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of unconfessed sin, He's convicting us so that we can confess it. And 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? When the devil condemns us of confessed sin, that's just him coming back trying to ruin our walk of faith with Christ. He wants us to feel bad. He wants us to be depressed about that we're not all that we would desire to be if God's in our heart. We should desire to be our very best, amen? Then the devil wants to come to us and remind us of those things, but here's what we tell the devil. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. They're gone. They're under the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. I saw a strange sight. I stumbled upon a story most strange. Like nothing my life, my street sense, my sly tongue had ever prepared me for. Hush, child. Hush now, and I will tell it to you. Even before the dawn one Friday morning, I noticed a young man, handsome and strong, walk in the alleys of our city. He was pulling an old cart filled with clothes, both bright and new, and he was calling in a clear tenor voice, Rags! Oh, the air was foul, and the first light filthy to be crossed by such sweet music. Rags! New rags for old. I'll take your tired rags. Rags! Now, this is a wonder, I, I thought to myself. For the man stood six foot four, and his arms were like tree limbs, hard and muscular, and his eyes flashed of intelligence. Could he find no other job than this, to be a ragman in the inner city? I followed him. My, my curiosity drove me, and I wasn't disappointed. Soon the ragman saw a woman sitting on her back porch. She was sobbing into a handkerchief, sighing and shedding a thousand tears. Her knees and elbows made a sad X. Her shoulders shook. Her heart was breaking. The ragman stopped his cart quietly and he walked to the woman, stepping around tin cans, dead toys, and used up pampers. Give me your rag, he said softly, and I'll give you another. He slipped the, hanker slipped the handkerchief from her eyes. She looked up and he laid across her palm a linen cloth so clean and new that it shined. She blinked from the gift to the giver. Then as he began to pull his cart again, the ragman did a strange thing. He put her stained handkerchief to his own face. And then he began to weep, to sob as grievously as she had done. His shoulders now shaking, yet she was left without a tear now. This is a wonder, I breathed to myself, and I, I followed the sobbing ragman like a child who cannot turn away from a mystery. Him shouting, rags, rags, new rags for old. In a little while, when the sky showed now gray behind the rooftops, I could see the shredded curtains hanging out black windows. The ragman came upon a girl whose head was wrapped in a bandage, whose Eyes were empty, blood soaked her bandage. A single line of blood ran down her cheek. Now the tall ragman looked upon this child with pity and he drew a lovely yellow bonnet from his, from his cart. Give me your rag, sweetie, he said, tracing his own line on her cheek. And I'll give you mine. 
The child could only gaze at him while he loosened her bandage, removed it, and tied it to his own head. The bonnet he set on hers, and, and I gasped at what I saw, for the bandage went the wound, for with the bandage went the wound. Against his brow it ran darker, more substantial blood. It was his own blood. Rags, rags, I'll take your old rags, cried the sobbing, bleeding, strong, intelligent ragman. The sun hurt both the sky now and my eyes. The ragman seemed more and more uh, to hurry. Are you going to work, he asked a man who leaned against the telephone pole. The man shook his head. The ragman pressed him. Do you have a job? He said, are you crazy? And he pulled away from the pole, revealing his right sleeve of his jacket. It was flat. The cuff stuck into the pocket. He had no arm. So said the ragman, give me your, your jacket and, I, and I'll give you mine. Such quiet authority in his voice. The one-armed man took off his jacket and so did the ragman and I trembled at what I saw. For the ragman's arm stayed in its sleeve and when the other put it on, he had two good arms now, thick as tree limbs. But the ragman only had one. Go to work, he said. After that, he found a drunk lying unconscious beneath the, the army blanket, an old man, hunched, weazened, and sick. He took that blanket and wrapped it around himself. And for the drunk, he left new clothes. And now I had to run to keep up with the ragman. Though he was weeping uncontrollably and bleeding freely at the forehead, pulling his cart with one arm, stumbling for drunkenness, falling again and again, exhausted, old, old, and sick. Yet he went with terrible speed. On spider's legs, he skirted through the alleys of the city, this mile and then the next, until he came to its limits. And then he rushed beyond. I wept to see the change in the, this man. I hurt to see his sorrow, and yet I needed to see where he was going with such haste, perhaps to know what drove the man so. A little old ragman, he came to a landfill. He came to the garbage pits, and then I wanted to help him in what he did, but I hung back, hiding. He climbed on a hill. With tormented labor, he cleared a little space on that hill. Then he sighed, and he laid down. He pillowed his head on a handkerchief and a jacket. He covered his bones with an army blanket, and the ragman died. Oh, how I cried to witness that death. I slumped in a junkyard car, Wailed and mourned as one who has no hope because I had come to love the ragman. Every other face had faded in the wonder of this man, and I cherished him now. But he died, and I sobbed myself to sleep. I didn't know. How could I know? I slept through Friday night and Saturday, and it's night too. But then Sunday morning, I was awakened by a violence. Light, pure and hard, demanding light, slammed against my sour face. And I blinked and I looked and I saw at last the first and greatest wonder of all. There was the ragman, folding the blanket most carefully. A scar on his forehead, but alive. And besides that, healthy. There was no sign of sorrow nor of age. And all the rags that he had gathered shine with cleanness. Well, then I, I lowered my head and trembling for all that I had seen. I myself walked up to the ragman. I told him my name with shame, for I was a sorry figure next to him. Then I took off all my clothes in that place and I said to him with a clear yearning in my voice, Would you dress me, old ragman? He dressed me. My Lord put new clothes on me, and I am a wonder beside him. The ragman, the ragman, the Christ, the Christ. You ask me why I'm happy? 
So I'll just tell you why, because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers who ask where they are, I say, my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, as far from moved as darkness from its dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me, praise God, my sins are gone. T'was the old time altar where God came in my heart, and now my sins are gone. The Lord took full possession, the devil did depart, hallelujah. My, I'm so glad my sins are gone. When Satan comes to tempt me and tries to make me doubt, I say, devil, my sins are gone. You got me into trouble, but Jesus got me out. I'm glad my sins are gone. Amen. I'm living now for Jesus. I'm happy night and day because my sins are gone. My soul is filled with music. With all my heart I say, I know my sins are gone. Why? They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary. As far removed from darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. You want your sins gone this morning? Then come to God in repentance and faith and let Him take the trash out. We stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the fact that you did not impute our sins to those of us who are saved. They're clean, removed, cast away. The ragman, the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, with the shedding of his precious blood, buried three days in a borrowed tomb. And then on Sunday, up from the grave, he arose. And because He's alive, we too will forever be alive. Those of us that have come to Him in faith and repentance and let Him take the trash out. God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice, be it here in this auditorium or listening on Facebook Live right now or maybe on YouTube at a later date, I pray, Father, that they will not take one more second of their life living lost in their sin, in their shame, in that that, that place called hell that they're not going to be in, that they're already in, and they're heading there quickly. God, I pray today that you would save the lost. And God, for us Christians, may this message be a reminder of the great price that was paid for you to take the trash out. And our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. God, thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, God, for, my, for your mercy and for your grace. And God, I beg you to not let one soul hear this message and remain lost. God, have your will and your way. And for us Christians, God, help us to walk in the newness of life that you gave us every day. Let us not be intimidated or beaten down or reminded of our sin our, and the guilt and the shame by the devil. We, we submit ourselves, therefore, to you, God, and we resist the devil, and we know he'll flee. Not because we're powerful, but because you are, God. So, God, have your will in your way. Maybe there's somebody this morning that they know they're saved, and they need to be baptized. God, I'd, they need to come forward, and they need to take Brother Copeland by the hand, and they need to tell him, I've, I've been saved. Now it's time to be baptized. That's the first act of obedience after salvation. It's not for salvation, it's after we've been saved. They that gladly received God's word were baptized. And so God, anybody here that's gladly received the word but has never been scripturally baptized, not before salvation, not sometime when they were a kid, but after they've been saved, let them come this morning and we'll baptize them here very soon. And then Father... There's folks maybe perhaps this morning that are dealing with sin, dealing with difficulties, bad habits. It's bad associations. And it's a bad life. God, you saved us from that. Let's not be a disgrace to your grace. At the old-fashioned altar, Lord, let us confess our sins knowing that you've said you're faithful and just 
and to forgive us. You will. Have your will and your way, Lord. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed.